and welcome to another episode of FUBAR. In today's episode, we are going to start a new series. This is the event-driven architecture series, and this is the first video of that series where we are going to talk about what is event-driven architectures. We are going to talk about coupling and decoupling your applications. We are going to talk about the benefits of event-driven applications, some use cases and things like that. And in the following videos, we were going to go deep into the patterns of event-driven applications, and I will show you a lot of codes and demo that you can add then utilize in your own applications. So this video, it's me talking. But if you are watching this in the future, uh, go to the playlist and you will find all the patterns. And if you're watching this as soon as the video is launched, then subscribe to this channel because in the next weeks, a lot of videos are coming around this topic. So the first question in an event-driven architecture kind of uh, video is to answer what is event-driven architectures. Well, event-driven architectures are an architecture style that uses events and asynchronous communication to loosely couple application components. So now basically all your different pieces of your application, of your distributed system, of your serverless application or whatever you're doing are independent from each other. So event-driven applications help you to be agile. So if you have an application that's distributed along multiple kind of teams, and different geographical zones or whatever, everybody can work independently. And also you can build reliable and scalable applications because each component scale independently. So for example, in my previous life, I used to work as a developer many years ago in a big company, but we were using a monolith. So basically everybody in the whole organization was committing into this uh, monolith. So that was very complicated because deploying was hard. Every time somebody broke a test, it affected all of us. And then scaling, well, if some piece of the application got very popular, the whole thing had to scale. This is event-driven applications are highly coupled with serverless. Sometimes uh, they are said that these are the architecture of serverless and serverless is like the operating part so you can see it like that. I have talked a lot about uh, event-driven architectures, not directly in the videos, but you will see that there is not much new in this series. So one important thing to understand before getting into the depth of event-driven architectures is the concept of coupling, because coupling is something that we want to avoid. Basically, coupling means the dependency that there is between one component, one service and another. So we want to avoid that. So, for example, one service needs to call another and it's waiting for it uh, in order to complete. And then you need to deploy things in a specific order. That's very highly coupled. So tightly coupled systems can be particularly efficient if you have very little components or you have a very small team and things like that. But in general, and when your application starts growing, it starts becoming um, many people working on the application and it becomes global and it has a lot of users, it tends to be flaky and uh, complicated. So that's why usually a lot of startups start with this kind of uh, <laughs> Rails uh, application and they're totally fine, they work with it, and then uh, in some point they become successful and they need to invest a lot of time on rewriting it or then live with it. But you have seen that I imagine in your experience. So as I said, when we have tightly coupled applications, some developer make a change, a breaking change, a deployment fail and everything, everybody in the kind of downstream or in the same monolith become affected. And that's um, very risky. It makes things very complicated to make change. Everybody needs to kind of sync in order to make the changes. And sometimes we might even need to deploy things in a particular order for things to work. And that uh, makes everything more complicated. We want to be agile. We want to be able to deploy whenever we need. And tight couple systems uh, don't allow us to do that. And also tight couple systems, our components have the problem of availability and scalability. I mentioned that uh, if one part of your application, usually there is this 20% that receives 80% of the traffic, you know, the Pareto law on an application. And if you are super tightly coupled, you may need to scale the whole thing. And also if um, one part of your application go down, then the whole thing goes down. So let's see it with an example, uh, because I think it's easier. 
So here we have an e-commerce and this is the typical e-commerce. We have the order service, the billing service, the shipping service, the inventory service, everything kind of uh, needs each other. I have made a video on how to do this event driven, but I have a whole playlist on that. But this is the, the idea. So we have this application, but in this case is tightly coupled. Everything depends on each other. The order service is waiting for the billing service. The shipping service is waiting for the inventory service and so on and so forth. So what happens if there is a problem in the inventory service and it goes down? Boom, everything will go down with it because everything is super highly coupled together that then one problem will impact the whole pipeline. And then our customers might see that. If we do that, uh, this in an event driven situation, the customer might not be aware that something in the uh, downstream failed and might get a notification or might be able to retry or things like that, but the whole thing doesn't explode in their face. So what we want to do, we want to reduce coupling. Reducing coupling is the act of reducing the interdependency of the different components and awareness that each of the components have of each other. So we want to keep that as uh, lightly coupled, loosely coupled as possible. Event-driven applications achieve loose coupling through asynchronous communication via events. So asynchronous is an important word. We are super used to synchronous things when one thing calls another and waits. And now we want this to be asynchronous. One thing sends a message and then maybe somebody takes it. Like when you send a letter, you send a letter and you are not kind of blocked waiting for the other person to reply. You're doing your life and you keep on going to work and cooking and, and showing life and then you get the letter back or an email in the modern world. <laughs> Synchronous is like in a conversation, you are talking and then you are kind of not doing anything until the other person replies because you are in there and you, you are having this conversation. So there are different ways to, to communicate. If we are the couple, we send the letter, then we can continue with our life. But if we are chatting with each other and then uh, you say something and then I leave and I start cooking and then 10 minutes later I come with the answer, it might be a little bit uncomfortable for you to be just standing there looking at me like mm, I'm a little block here, just answer my question. So when the first component sent a message or an event, as we call them here, then uh, it will continue its life. Doesn't matter if the second component replies or not, or it fails or whatever. And when working with this type of architectures, then the sender of the message is not aware of the receiver and the receiver is not aware of the sender. So they are very independent from each other. They are just aware of this contract that is the event. So basically now you can change one of the sender or the receiver and while you keep the event with the same signature, then we are good to go. So now you can make changes with less risk in your application. So for example, you will have, uh, you will end up with an architecture like this. You will have your producers in one side, your consumers of events in one side, and in the middle, the event broker that will be uh, managing the event. So the event broker in this case is getting the messages and knows where they need to be sent and send them. There are many types of event brokers and we will talk about them in the follow videos. But for now, just get the idea. There's the producers, there's the consumers, and there is the event broker in the middle. So some of the main benefits of event-driven applications is the ability of building and deploying applications independently. So now we can uh, work in different teams, they're isolated, they can just deploy their application and while they're adhered to the contract, that is this message, this event, then we are fine. So that's good. No risk on impacting others and we can scale as well and fail independently. So that's important. If we have any problems and one of our applications fail, then the message, the event will be uh, stored in the message broker or will be directed somewhere else. We will see that in the patterns, but then uh, the, the sender will not get an error. And also if we need to scale part of our application, we can just scale that bit and then that's it. And then one super benefit of this is the capability of extending our application. So now we have the capability of building new features without changing the existing applications, just start working with the events that are floating around the system and start building new applications. So now let's jump into the key components of an event-driven application. I mentioned event many times. I sometimes say message, sometimes event, but the right way 
word is event. An event is basically a signal in a change of state. Basically, uh, the shopping cart changed state or a credit card or something like that. So events occur in the past. So it's not like go and do something, but it's like the order has been created. The application has been submitted. There is food in the table or I send you a letter and I did this. So these events are immutable. So the order was created, the order was created. Nobody can change that event after it's submitted. You can then update the order, then you can delete the order, but those are different events. It's important to have this immutability in your events because then uh, now your application can be totally asynchronous and can be listening to the different events and taking actions without needing to go and verify that everything is right. And events are observed. So you are as a sender not sending an event to a receiver, but you are sending an event to this message broker and then the receiver is listening to those events. So that's uh, interesting things that you have to have in mind when working with event-driven applications. So I mentioned when I show you the previous slide that we have the event producers, the event broker and the event consumer. So basically the event producer is producing the events and send them into the broker. This can be functions, this can be front ends, this can be buttons, this can be IoT devices, this can be AWS services like S3, a new file was created. This can be Dynamo sending a new record is created. So many things can be event producers. Then we have the event broker and these are um, mediators between the consumers and the producers that are basically routing the messages, the events to the right places. So they have different mechanisms and we will look that in the patterns, what kind of brokers they are there, but they will send the message to the right target. And then we have the consumers that are the downstream uh, components that get activated when new events are there. They are listening in the broker. They say, hey, I'm listening to this type of events. And then when those events happen, they get activated. That can be a Lambda function. There can be um, I don't know, some other compute or some AWS service like an API that gets triggered, depends on, on what you're doing. So to finalize the video, let's look at some good use cases where we would like to use event-driven applications. So when we want microservices to talk to each other, this is great. You have a lot of microservices distributed. Every team is working on them independently. They deploy independently, they scale independently, and they talk between each other with events. Uh, sometimes we use uh, REST for this kind of communication, but if it's internal, why not to use events? If you want a video on why REST or why event are REST uh, event-driven applications and comparing these type of things, let me know in the comments. But the communication between microservices is a great example for this. Then another thing uh, that we want to use event-driven applications is for IT automation. So basically, uh, we can be uh, monitoring EC2 instances and when there is an alarm that says or, or a metric that gets somewhere and it says, hey, now this uh, instance is running out of um, compute power or memory or whatever, that can trigger an event and that event can then trigger maybe a Lambda function that launches another instance or can trigger an auto scaling group or whatever. And we use that a lot. I think this was one of the first use cases of Lambda, for example, as an event driven uh, part. And then we have four application integration. And this kind of is similar to the microservice communication. But when we talk about application communication, we talk about two different applications talking to each other. So for example, uh, we can integrate a SaaS uh, application into our own application. So we can send an event and that might create a ticket in some other uh, application that is not managed by us, or they can send us an event. I don't know, there is a new help request or something, and then we get the ticket in as an event. So again, this is uh, something that we used to do with REST or with HTTP calls. Now we do it with events and well, you can uh, tell me if you want that type of video. But with that said, I will end the video for here today. 
This is the first episode on uh, event driven applications. This is very theoretical, I know, but I want to build a foundation in order to, in the next video, start talking about the patterns and showing you code. All the videos following up will be about patterns and we'll have examples with CDK. And then at the end, I will start adding maybe uh, more architectural videos if you want. So let me know in the comments what kind of questions you have about event driven applications, what kind of things you want to know because this series is on the build right now so if you like this don't forget to like it and subscribe and i see you in the next episode of full bar ciao, ciao.